you, Dave. Good morning, guys. Maybe one day we'll just uh, stand Dave up here and do uh, free association theology. <laughs> and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> I, I appreciate what he, I appreciate his mind. I can't quite understand it. I'm not inside it, but uh, <clears throat> appreciate it, Dave. Hey, we're going to start a new, a new little segment today. We won't do it every week, but I hope to do it frequently. It's called Men at Work. And uh, you may be called upon to just tell something about what you're doing outside of here. And uh, so this morning, uh, if you haven't met Ed Rarick, I want you to meet Ed and have Ed come and tell us, what are you doing outside these walls? I didn't know you were going to do this today. Oh, of course. <laughs> do you need a microphone? Let's get a... <laughs> are you going to ask me questions? You just want me yeah. To... What are you doing? <laughs> no. Uh, no, I know, I know a, a whole bunch of things that you're doing, but I mean, among other things, um, Ed volunteered in our IT department, and uh, he's indispensable, actually, uh, to our office staff, but there's something else you do with your skills. Okay, I'll describe that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not an IT person. Speak up, Ed. I know, but you know how to read. <laughs> is it on? Yeah, it is. There you go. Uh, well, aside from doing that, I, and I'm not even sure how I got started doing this, but several years ago, I, I got into building cabinet doors, kitchen cabinet doors, and cabinets and things like that, so I like woodworking. And um, I learned that there are a lot of widows around that are roughly my age, <laughs> that uh, their kitchen is really important to them, and they don't have money to upgrade it. And so I started doing that. So I literally, f uh, f you know, find a widow that really has a kitchen that needs an upgrade, and I go in and rip all the doors off, and I buy all the wood, and I, uh, I remake their cabinet doors and essentially change the look of their kitchen to something that looks brand new. Hmm. And, you know, I give them soft-closed doors and drawers. I make all new drawers for them. And um, it doesn't seem reasonable to do that when I when I think about it in light of what's going on in Ukraine and mm. you know Haiti and all these other places. Yeah. But when I'm done, and I just finished one uh, this week, I'd actually, I get teared up when I think about it mm. to watch the woman in the kitchen as I'm leaving. Uh, it, it just impacts their life in mm. a substantial way. Mm. And it's usually a cost to them of about $800. Wow. Uh, versus 40,000 or 50,000. Uh, and, and then I, there's plumbing that goes along the way, mm. and their iPads don't work, so I help them with that. And I just end up having this, <laughs> I, do, I end up having this bond with these, these gals that, um, mm. that it just keeps lasting. And so anyway, it's an unusual ministry, and so I, I want to keep it up, um, and so that's what I do. So uh, could you use help with that? Well, I've Only thought about skilled help, right? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually thought about that. Uh, Steve, all of you know Steve Collier. He was going to try and make it last week, and, and he didn't. But um, he's got a, a huge workshop, and so I've transitioned my projects over to his, largely over to his workshop because of the, the space. And with that, I thought we could actually do more of these if I had you know one or mm -hmm. two other guys yeah. uh, that would be willing, they already know or willing to learn, because I learned it that we could impact more people in a shorter amount of time because it takes about three weeks out of my life mm. um, uh, to get one of these done, including all the other things uh, wow. that I'm doing. So, yeah, I actually see this as a, uh, as a ministry that where we could do eight, nine, ten of these a year. Wow, that's cool. Um, so how do you find each other? How do you find each Well, people? you have to talk about it, and, you know, yeah. I always struggle with that because people think you're trying to get glory. Well, no, I'm looking for candidates. Yeah. Uh, and so I, 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 my wife knows about it, and she's in a variety of circles, and I've I found people that way. And I just, mm. when somebody has a computer problem, they somehow know my number. Yeah. Uh, and I go to their house and say, your kitchen sucks. We're going to fix this. <laughs> uh, and so, I, and that's the truth. That's, that's, that's great. That's what happens. Uh, so, and I'm always looking for candidates. Yeah. And then I have kids that, suck my will to live out of me with the cabinet work also <laughs> yeah. so uh, i make it for you know quite a few people but that's i'm always looking for candidates right that's now fantastic. I'm, uh, i need a new one i just finished one well the, the reason we're going to do this is because there's a lot of 
service and talent and just life experience in this room. So we're going to let you see some of that. And uh, by the way, my wife feels like a widow every Sunday. Can you yes. come over? No. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I come over enough. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm one of those guys. Yeah, yeah take that with you. Yeah, I wondered how you, how you find these people. You know, you go up to a woman and say, how are your drawers working? You know? Uh, <laughs> but there's, we're going we're gonna to hear some different testimonies. That's not a thimble full of what Ed is doing, but uh, just know that that's going on. And uh, it's, it's great to know about it, great to refer people, and it's also great to just have a partner in ministry in that way. Well, welcome to Ironworks. We are... We're finally to the 10th commandment, and uh, this is the 31st installment in this series, of, uh, but we're not really talking about the 10 commandments. We're using them as a launching pad to say, how would I live in this world with a biblical worldview? How can I constantly, for the rest of my life, try to look at what's happening in the world and look through the lens that is, that is filtering the world out and the Bible in. How can I do that? Well, the Ten Commandments gives us God's moral wiring diagram. And uh, he, he, he recognizes that if you, if you don't recognize these things, you will short out your life. And then there's 613 case laws that go along with that. We'll start a series on those next week. No. <laughs> But the, the Bible, the, the, the Torah, takes the Ten Commandments, which are the moral law, and then it brings it down into practical things and shows us ourselves. And so today we're on the Tenth Commandment, and uh, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. In other words, his lifestyle. That's what uh, the house in the Old Testament symbolized the prosperity of its owner. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, her beauty, or her gifts, or her kitchen. Um, or her cabinets. <laughs> yeah, or her cabinets. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. We won't go there. Um, you know, it's, there's the old joke about, yeah, your, his, his house is more attractive than his wife, you know. Or his male servant, or his female servant. In other words, his advantages. Uh, you might not have a servant. You don't get your house cleaned. You don't have those, those things that make life easier for you, but your neighbor does those conveniences. Or his ox. His ox was like his tractor. It was the tool that he used. It's the power tool that helped him do his work, his equipment. You shall not covet his donkey, his transportation, or anything that is your neighbor's. Well, the word covet is uh, not something to be toyed with because it's down inside of me and inside of you. To covet means to desire strongly, I want more, or to greedily aspire to something else. And uh, there's three little nasty cousins that all feel like the same thing, but they're slightly different, and here they are. I envy because it's yours. I'm jealous because it's mine and I don't want you to have it, but I covet just because it's there. I didn't even know I wanted it until it flashed before me in 400 commercials and it kept coming back. Or, you know, I saw it on the screen, whatever it was. So the thing we want to talk about today is that commandment number one. Which, which commandment number one? You shall have no other gods before me. Commandments 1 and 10 cut to the heart. They're not about behavior. And so the bookends of the Ten Commandments drive us right into the heart and show us the radical purposes of the law. The law is there not to show me my perfection, but to show me what? My sin. And this one really cuts to the heart. And this, this one exposes our hearts. I read this uh, story. Uh, we, we call this guy Bill. He says, by most standards, Bill is doing great. At 31, he's an electrical engineer at GM, making $150,000 a year. He has two cars, including his beloved Alfa Romeo. And he's going scuba diving in Cancun in July. 
but something's gnawing at him. His friend, who got a 30% raise to go to California and work at a tech job with stock options, and his buddy with a 32-foot boat. People all around him seem to be cashing in, and Bill's idea about success is changing. Quote, if I didn't know any better, I'd be perfectly happy with what I'm doing. But it gets to me when I see my peers, people I relate to, people my same age doing better than I am. You start to feel discontent. And isn't that the, isn't that the nub of covetousness that we have? I see it, and I want it, and your having it drives me crazy. That's what the spirit of covetousness, when I see my neighbor having it. So welcome to Romans chapter 7, and Paul, the apostle, gives kind of an autobiography of how this commandment touched his heart. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, it says, What shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, yet it, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. In other words, if I didn't see the boundary, I wouldn't know that there was danger over there. But the law gives me the boundary. For I would not have known what it is to covet. Now, of all the Ten Commandments, why does he pick that one? I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death for me, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Why did Paul pick out the commandment about coveting? Well, because he was a Pharisee prior to his conversion, and he says in his own autobiography, I exceeded all of them in zeal. So outwardly, Paul could never have been convicted of any of the other commandments. But then coveting came along, and it went beneath the behavior, and it showed him his heart. And here's where Paul falls on his knees, utterly helpless, Because the law doesn't expose how righteous we are, it exposes how covetous we are. So we look across the field and the the neighbor's ox is stronger, or he has one and I don't. We look at his wife, we look at his home, we look at his conveniences, we look at somebody's advantages, and we didn't even know that we wanted it until we saw it. And that's really our world in which we live. So what do we recognize about ourselves in the 10th commandment? I want to just give you three things. We recognize, my, I recognize, maybe you recognize, my discontent with God's purposes. And commandment number one gives us God's purpose, that he would be number one, not only number one in timing, but number one in priority, that I would have no other gods before him. And we live in an age where, where consumerism, capitalism, we talked about this a few weeks ago, though it can bring many, many benefits to us, has huge dangers for us. Because somebody, has, I don't know how they've added this up, but we see 3,000 advertising messages a day somehow. Everything we look at, and the logo on my shirt, to the billboard, to the television, to the screen on, on the computer, all these ads to say, get, 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 get. And consumerism consumerism doesn't deny God, it just moves him over (laughs) to ride shotgun to what I want and what I crave. And something happened in our culture, I mean it was alive long before this, but somewhere in the 60s, our culture, some of you remember that? Uh, Somewhere in the 60s, we crossed a threshold that said, it is now not only permissible, it is to your advantage to indulge. And there's no boundaries on that. If you see it, you should have it. You deserve it. Um, and uh, that is a huge danger 
not only to our financial lives, but to our spiritual lives. The whole fabric of our nation is woven around craving and covetousness. It's really the fuel of capitalism unless it's governed by something bigger. So God's purposes in that setting seem less real than the things I can acquire for myself. So I begin to question the purposes of God. And my activities will probably never indict me for that. But my heart is often covetousness. And I covet what I don't have. And it says in Luke 12, 30, it says, the pagan world runs after these things, but seek first the kingdom of God. Now, I know that sounds high and flighty, you know, like I should be focused on God, but, but that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to find him first, and if he gives us good things, those come next. But when we bypass that and question his purposes and go after it, then we end up in a, like it says in, in 1 Timothy, we pierce ourselves with many, many griefs. So there are some lifestyle symptoms to this particular aspect, and I would call them lust and futility and discontent. In, in Jeremiah, there's this uh, famous passage in Jeremiah chapter 2 where he's talking to the Israelites. Or, excuse me, it should be Jeremiah chapter 4. It says, no, it's Jeremiah 2. There it is. Here we go. I'm going to start back with verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods? Even though they are, there are, no go- they are no gods, for my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be, be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, pushed me over, away from the throne, and they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, you know what a cistern is. It's a place to store the water. And so instead of relying on the rain and snow that God sends to give us water, we've hewed out our own way to store it up. And Jeremiah says, there's only only one problem here. First of all, it's going to be in short supply. And secondly, it leaks. And you're not going to have anything when it's all over. And this is what happened in the nation of Israel. And so they ended up with, with a real sense of futility. And then in Haggai chapter 1, verse 6, it says, talks about their discontent. You have planted much, but have, but have little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes that are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. <laughs> you ever felt like that? This is a bottomless pit. It just goes, it flows right through me. So we need to just ask ourselves some questions. We need to learn as we go through this, where is the freedom that this house was going to bring me and my family? Doesn't mean your house is wrong necessarily, but if we're looking for it to supply something that we can't get through the Lord, then it's the wrong thing. Where's the advantage that that major purchase was going to give me some leverage on? Uh, Where's the love we were going to share in that great excursion? You know, a lot of people, I watch a lot of marriages, and I watch a lot of people taking really glam shots in Cancun, but at home, their marriage is, is cold. And so there's a lot of performance that doesn't really reach the heart. You know, who gets the credit for everything that I've accumulated? You know, is that the Lord or my hard work? So we distrust or we, we distrust God's purposes uh, when, we, when we get covetousness, we're basically saying, I, I know how to do life and I can do this on my own. Secondly, another way we recognize covetousness is to distrust God's love. We distrust his love. In Luke chapter 12, there's a parable, uh, verse 15. Jesus said, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For no one's life, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told him a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, you know the story. 
And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to, share, to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, it's easy to see that parable in a flannel graph story in Sunday school in third grade. And maybe that's where it sticks. But this man is basically saying, you know, I distrust the love of the Father, and I'm going to take care of myself. And uh, there's a lifestyle symptom of covetousness, and it's pictured in this man's story. That is this, there's an unbreakable connection that if my eye is full of things, my heart will be full of worry. So listen to your symptoms. How much do you worry? You may say, well, I don't, I don't worry. Well, how much do you want to control? <laughs> am, I, am I a controller, which is basically uh, blue-collar worry? It's, it's working at making sure nothing goes wrong. And when we assess our, our worry, we can often trace it back to something we've, we want or something that we've achieved or something that we've stored up, and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, in the financial realm, that's pretty easy to document. You know, we're worried about what's going to happen in the world. And because we've got our 401k parked out there, what's going to happen to that? Could I lose 30% of that again? Well, maybe so. And covetousness creates this constantly. And uh, Jesus is saying, trust me, walk with me, told a parable about the the birds being fed and the lilies of the field being clothed and said, this is the way I want you to depend on me. So covetousness has a distrust of God's love. And thirdly, uh, how do I recognize covetousness in my life? Well, it's a disappointment with God's timing. So what does Matthew 6.33 say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness And all these things will be added unto you. So again, it's not only first in terms of priority, it's first in terms of time. That covetousness can so easily say, you know, I I want that and I don't want to wait. I I deserve it now. I want it now. I'm going to go after it now. And I I can make it work now. And so we become disappointed with God's sense of urgency I have a lot of good ideas for God. Don't you? I've had some recently, and he just said, no. And it wasn't about things. It was about accomplishment. It was about a lead pastor. It was about all kinds of things. And I often, I just, you know, I have to submit to his timing. And covetousness blocks the heart by binding us to a certain timetable that we think is better than what God has designed for us. And we could probably all trace some things in our lives and our hearts, even our relational lives, where we went ahead of God because we wanted something so badly. And we look back and say, you know, that was my own flesh and I'm I'm bearing the fruit or the thorns of that kind of decision. And so covetousness can often say to God, I love you, but your timing's off, so I'm going to go do this. And uh, we just go for it. We need to seek first the kingdom of God. Have you seen the movie Amadeus? Amadeus is about Mozart. And a fascinating movie. um, And it's really about Salieri, who um, who was this court musician. He was hired by the king to write marches and entrances and do music for parades and all this kind of stuff. And he was a very competent musician. And then along comes this nitwit, braggart, uncontrollable genius called Mozart. And he sits down at the piano and just writes all this stuff. And it's, it's florid and it's 
beautiful and it's majestic and it just flows out of this guy. And, and, and he's just this twerp, according to Salieri. And Salieri realizes he has enough, Salieri has enough talent to recognize that he doesn't have that kind of talent. And it rots his gut. He can't stand it. And the, the film ends with him basically in despair because he's so envious, so covetous of the, the gifts of Mozart that it ruins his life. And he can't have it. And he doesn't want, he doesn't want Mozart to have it either. It's, it's a real, I'd encourage you to watch it on a really depressing night, all right? <laughs> So, so here's some symptoms to covetousness. We talked about lust. We talked about, um, what did we talk about? I uh, got it right here. Can't, rem- can't remember it. Uh, futility, yeah, futility. And about discontent. Also, covetousness brings us um, this sense of, of worry and then here's another lifestyle symptom of covetousness. It's anger. It's impatience. Um, it's criticism. It's uh, constantly being the critic. And um, covetousness brings this sense that I deserve it and I'm going to get it and I want it. And if I don't have it, there could be a, a real sense of anger and rage going on inside of me. I think we need to look at some of these symptoms and ask ourselves the question about the 10th commandment. Have I really taken it seriously? And it doesn't mean that you go out and live like a monk and resign all your your pleasures, but it does mean, am I content? We'll talk about that next week, but am I content with what I have? Am I content with God's purposes? Am I pursuing those? And am I content with his timing for me? Because I want so much more than I can have And I think if any of the commandments uh, pierces the heart, it's this one, because this is an area for, I think, constant confession, constant cleansing, constant asking, Lord, show me what I really want. So let me give you a couple of defense mechanisms, or, you know, and one for, a couple of them for defense and a couple of them for, for offense. Number one, for covetousness would be to just pause, we try to teach our kids this. You know, they, they want something, and we say, well, you need to save for that. You can't have it today. You can get it in a month. And, you know, our children hate that, but I hate it too. I want it now. So one of the things is to pause, sleep on it, talk to somebody uh, about it, and uh, make sure that covetousness not, does not rule you on the showroom floor to make a decision that you're going to regret later. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon, and uh, so maybe you need some fences. Fences never stop sinning in the heart, but they can help keep us from making a mistake that's even worse. So maybe you, need, maybe you don't need to go to the parade of homes this spring. You know, maybe you should stay off the showroom floor of that new pickup truck or car. Uh, maybe you need to watch less TV or stay off certain screens on your television because they cause you, they trigger the covetousness of the heart. Those are defense mechanisms, and they never totally work, but they can protect us from going deeper. But the best antidote for, to covetousness is to invest in the next world. Jesus said, store up treasure for yourself in heaven. And that's not only through monetary giving, but that monetary giving is an automatic curb to saying, let's make sure the Lord gets his first, then we'll live on what we have. But it's also about service. It's about giving your body. It's about using your skills. It's, it's storing up things that brings far more satisfaction than the stuff that we accumulate. And we're all going to go home and go through our garages and our attics now and <laughs> Get a dumpster and keep this stuff from clinging to us because God has promised us long-term pleasures that come through putting him first. But if we don't believe him or we think his timing is off, we won't pursue those things. So I want you to examine your hearts and share openly around your tables. I've got some, some questions for you that I hope that you will go right up to the edge of discomfort 
and take one more step. You're safe here. So let's talk about the questions in applying this lesson today. God bless you.